Hello everyone, I'm Marcy Goodman, the Executive Director of the Cleveland International Film Festival, and I get to welcome you to this evening's CIF 45 Streams Happy Hour, sponsored by Great Lakes Brewing Company. Our friends at Great Lakes Brewing Company encourage you to put your phone down during this happy hour and to consider replacing it with a Great Lakes beer, like this can of Dortmunder Gold Lager. Before I go any further, I'd like to introduce Kelly Parker from the Cleveland Hearing and Speech Center, who will be interpreting for us during the first half of our program. Thank you, Kelly, for being here. This is a very special day for the festival because it's our birthday and our birthday bash is sponsored by Pierre's Ice Cream. Thank you, Pierre's, for making so much fun possible during CIF 45 strings. We've been handing out birthday presents all day through social media channels. And at the end of tonight's happy hour, we will randomly select a winner of our final giveaway of the day, a Pierre's Ice Cream Party Pack. The lucky person will be chosen from those who submit questions during this happy hour. So please be sure to participate in the YouTube chat. The first day of the very first festival was April 13th, 1977. And here we are today because of our visionary founder, Jonathan Foreman. Because of my amazing predecessor, David Woodkowski. Because of decades of outstanding trustee leadership and involvement. Because of thousands of devoted volunteers because of hundreds and hundreds of dedicated seasonal consultants, because of our extraordinary full-time staff of seven, and most of all, because of you, our remarkable audience. Thank you for these 45 film festivals. And if you're wondering what this festival would like for its birthday, we're glad you asked. Donations in any amount to our challenge match would be greatly appreciated. Simply find your way to clevelandfilm.org forward slash donate. In addition to being our birthday bash happy hour, this is a very special gathering because tonight we will be presenting our first ever Groundbreaker Award. And for that, I will turn it over to our artistic director, Mallory Martin. Thank you, Marcy. This year, our Groundbreaker program, sponsored by Case Western Reserve University, serves to not only educate our audience about structural racism, but also to specifically elevate and support BIPOC filmmakers. Representation matters, both in front of and behind the camera. And it's our mission at SIF to continue to break down the barriers met by marginalized communities within the film industry. The Groundbreaker Award, sponsored by Cover My Men's, is our newest award presented to one filmmaker in particular who we feel is a pioneer in their field and whose work has proven to lift up marginalized voices. This recognition comes with a $5,000 cash award to help support the filmmakers' future work, as well as a party pack from Pierre's Ice Cream shipped to their front door. We are beyond honored to present the first ever Groundbreaker Award to Ashley O'Shea, the director, producer, and cinematographer of the documentary Unapologetic. Oh my yeah. goodness, it's an actual <laughs> award, oh my God. <laughs> We will also ship this to your front door. <laughs> My mouth just dropped because I didn't know I was getting this party pack. Also, I'm so happy. <laughs> wow, thank you, um, thank you so much. It, it, it's really um, humbling, and I'm just so grateful for this recognition from the Cleveland International Film Festival. I, as someone who grew up in the Midwest in Indianapolis and really grew up around the arts and film, it's amazing to just see so many of our institutions still standing. Um, and for Unapologetic in particular, um, you know, four and a half, five, I guess six years ago now almost, I was catapulted into this journey uh, because I was so inspired and so energized by young Black people in Chicago that were continuing to organize around the killing of 
a young black woman named Rakia Boyd. Um, and, you know, this is an award you're giving to me as a groundbreaker, but I would argue that they are the true groundbreakers. They have caused so much amazing change and shift in Chicago and inspired the world and beyond. So I really want to just dedicate this to Janae and Bella, my main two protagonists and to all the young Black people, the young Black women and queer folks and trans folks that continue to center themselves, um, even at a time where just yesterday, a couple of days ago, another young Black person was, was lost at the hands of police. Um, and so it just, I, I thank you all for seeing, um, for recognizing my vision, uh, for uplifting my voice. And um, yeah, I, I guess we'll see what the future holds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Ashley. We're, we're so thrilled for you to be our first recipient of the Groundbreaker Award. This award, uh, which was made by a local artist named Karen Bender, is a piece of art that will help remind you of your time here virtually in Cleveland. In addition to spending time with us this week, uh, Ashley has been and will continue to be uh, very busy meeting virtually with a number of other organizations in the area, including Black Women Work, Black Lives Matter Cleveland, and showing up for racial justice in Northeast Ohio. Um, so thank you, Ashley, again, for accepting this award. Thanks for sharing your film with us. I'd love to now move on to tonight's happy hour. Uh, each night of the festival, our filmmakers and guests answer your questions about their films. If you're watching live and would like to ask a question, just use the YouTube chat feature over on the right-hand side, and our moderators will ask selected questions to the filmmakers and guests. On tonight's happy hour, we'll be joined by guests from the feature films Unapologetic and Voodoo Macbeth. And now we'll start our first segment led by SIF Special Programs Coordinator, Deidre McPherson. Hi, Deidre. Thank you, Mallory. Hi, everyone. I'm Deidre McPherson, Special Programs Coordinator of the Cleveland International Film Festival. I'd like to reintroduce our special guest from Unapologetic, director, producer, cinematographer, Ashley O'Shea. Uh, so let's get started. Hi, Ashley. Welcome. Hello. And congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so, so much. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the main protagonist in the film. Uh, the film follows Janae and Bella, two fierce young abolitionist organizers whose individual stories and experiences strike a really beautiful and amazing balance in the film. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you came to identify them and select them to be uh, lead characters in the film. Definitely. Um, so with, with uh, Janae, uh, Janae was really the first person that I reached out to about this idea at all. Um, she, at the time, in, in the fall of 2015, when we began filming, she was the local chapter chair of, of Black Youth Project 100. And um, at the time, they were just like a really well-known um, group and collective here in the city and nationally. And so um, when I decided to make a project that was going to be about the movement, but from this specific perspective of, of Black queer feminism. I just like cold call email Janae and um, outside of her work with BYP 100, she was also beginning her first semester PhD program and was 24 years old. Um, and I was just like, that's a lot to be doing. Um, and I became just, I was really curious in like how she planned to like balance all of all of these different um, ambitions that she had. Um, and so it originally started there and I thought it was gonna be a short and then the universe said otherwise. Um, a couple months later, there was just a lot of really milestone moments in Chicago, like the tape of the killing of Laquan McDonald came out and then um, the police superintendent was forced to resign and so I just felt and could recognize that this was like a milestone moment in the city. Um, and it felt like it was like the project was literally asking me to make it a, a feature length film. And so that's when I um, began to interview other possible um, other possible subjects. And, and I met Bella at a I saw Bella first. I, <laughs> I saw her perform at uh, Chicago Police Headquarters and I was just so um, energized by her literal energy and her lyricism. Um, and so after I talked to her, you know, I found out she was from Chicago, from Chicago's West Side. 
and had this long history of incarceration in her family, but also just of like amazing community building. Um, but she was really still finding her voice as an artist activist. And so um, they kind of, I just felt like they balanced each other really well. And, uh, you know, we just, we just went on from there. <laughs> Excellent. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the Black Youth Project um, 100, BYP 100. It's a national youth-led organization that organizes with a Black queer feminist slant. Uh, at one point in the film, uh, a member of BYP 100 says, if black queer feminists are not free, then none of us will be free. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how sexism and homophobia weakens and destroys movements, particularly in the, in the movement for black lives? Yeah, yeah, I mean, the that quote and 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 all these systems that you're pointing to uh, really just go to show that um, there's marginalization and discrimination within marginalized marginalized communities themselves. So um, I think even though a lot of Black people exist uh, in the system of of Blackness, you know, we're also in systems of patriarchy and capitalism and a lot of that kind of trickles down into, into our communities themselves. Um, and so that's what was just so interesting and captivating about the movement that was happening in Chicago, because I mean, for one, now I know that, that, that this idea of, of centering the most marginalized of the marginalized is not a completely new idea. Like there were black women in the sixties and earlier, like Ella Baker and F Fannie Lou Hamer and Ida B. Wells, mm -hmm. who were really pushing for this, for this participatory approach as well. Um, but I think that we always heard about like those central male figures more so than we did about other, like the women or other marginalized voices that were, that were pushing the work ahead. Um, and so folks, young black people in Chicago basically were like, you know, if we center the most marginalized of our whole society in the social movement work that we're doing, then once they get free and once we we achieve what change we need for their experience and, and their identities, it's automatically gonna trickle up the, the ladder uh, and, and achieve freedom for everybody else. Um, and so I think that's that's just so important to note and to remember that we have to fight for all black people, not just black men um, or even black women. You know, we got to fight for black trans folks and, and um, gender nonconforming folks because there's so many identities that exist within blackness itself. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, so is that also partially how you arrived at the title of the film, Unapologetic? I, <laughs> I'm like, I wish it was. <laughs> I wish it was that deep. No, but um, I think it was one of those things where like retroactively, yes, the answer is yes. But at the time it was one of the sayings of the movement and particularly BYP 100, they had a phrase unapologetically black that they were using in a lot of, in a lot of, in a lot of their actions and campaigns. And I think maybe just be from osmosis and just like filming a lot, I was, I, I was like taking it in. And so once we kind of had to first package the film to try to like fundraise and, and get a team and everything like that, um, I originally named it Unapologetically and, um, you know, like kind of like a signature. And uh, my team members said that that is, was too long and too many syllables. So we cut off the back end uh, and just tried Unapologetic. Um, and it, it really was like, even though it was kind of like a, not a super direct decision. It's kind of like once it happened, it made complete sense. Um, and, you know, really reflects, I think the energy of Janae and Bella and also just like the whole movement here, you know, people aren't, they're, they're at a point where they're no longer apologizing or asking for permission to present themselves fully in, in black social space. Uh, and so I think, you know, it, it definitely took on a, a deeper and uh, really distinct meaning in the end. So there were scenes in the film that really, speaking about, you know, in, in line with being your unapologetic self, uh, there were scenes in the film that demonstrate the joys of being Black in America and the importance of shifting away from these sensationalized narratives 
and brutal history only. What are your thoughts on how love and joy fit into the movement for Black Lives? I mean, they're crucial. Uh, they're, they're, I mean, if you just think about life itself, you know, we don't just exist as sadness and struggle and pain. We really depend on love and joy to sustain us through the difficult moments of our lives. Um, and so, and, but of course, that's something that's really hard to do uh, with, with this social movement where, you know, you might be organizing around a police killing or an act of brutality and then another one happens and you're having to rapid fire start to organize in in response to that um but i i recognized and i knew that that was something in my life that i still had to center uh as i was doing this work and so when i kind of saw those moments happening with janae and bella in the larger movement i knew that that was an essential part of the documentation uh and also just like for audience members that um you know maybe identify as black women and and had the experience these experiences of love and joy um i wanted them to feel like they could see themselves uh and understand themselves better by seeing this this uh experience of black love and joy um and especially for organizers and people that are putting their heads down and doing the work every day kind of as a reminder that you like kind of need that other side to be able to sustain the very difficult and traumatic work that you're doing day by day. Uh, and it's, it's in Chicago, you know, it's like, that is all encapsulating. That's why there's so much art and culture and music in the work that they do, because people need that kind of expression to be able to sustain themselves for the long term. Yes, and that was something else that I really appreciated about the film was how it, it kind of hinted at Chicago's legacy of activism and mm -hmm. and you know it was strong during the civil rights movement um, and it's incredibly strong now with the work of of um, activists like Janae and and Bella um, I was wondering if if and how the film will be used in an organizing capacity and, and how you're going about doing that because this film I've, I've read a few reviews and and it, it, one of the reviews I read said that it was it was crucial for those who are really interested in learning more about racial equity work. So I was mm -hmm. curious, do you think some of the additional primary audiences for the film are and how you hope the film could be used in an educational capacity? One of our one of our main audiences is definitely um, young black or target audience rather is is young black people um, and young people of color to really introduce them and, and uh, energize them to want to get involved in, in this movement. Um, I think that we present Janae and Bella intentionally as these, these two distinct identities because I want to encourage young people to understand that they don't have to look a certain way or have a certain experience to feel like they can get involved. Um, because, you know, that's just so, it's so off from what I experienced when I was going through school. Um, so we're, organizing a pretty um, robust impact campaign um, that we've done a couple things around so far. And, you know, obviously it's a little different because we're in a virtual setting, um, but really our goal is to get this film into the hands of organizers um, to use as a tool to, to organize, to bring more people um, into the fold to serve as a platform, to be able to remember and recollect moments that they brought, brought about change to create intergenerational spaces where folks that were that were organizing during the civil rights movement and the Black Power movements can talk to the to the organizers of today, to talk about um, mental health in in activism and organizing and protest, um, and you know that is all of that is a very um, uh, a lot to try to do, but you know I think because of the uprisings that happened last summer around the killings of of. Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, there was just like a lot of interest in like how people could contribute to the moment. Um, and so we've been lucky enough to, to get some, you know, both financial and in-kind support to be able to do that. Um, and this summer, we definitely plan to hold um, at least one intergenerational event uh, in Chicago where people can gather and also one around like mental and physical health. Um, and, you know, unfortunately every summer it kind of 
it's kind of like a burn it all down mentality because of because of the policing that's happening. Mm -hmm. So uh, hopefully it can kind of just give people a moment to to take a step back and it can be like a solve to the wounds and, and energize them uh, for, for the fight ahead. Absolutely. And that's that's the thing. Um, this film was so energizing and it stirs up quite a few emotions because even as, as recent as you know, day before yesterday, um, killings, they just keep popping up. And so mm -hmm. um, it's, it's really a, a powerful tool and, and a testament to why this award and, and the work that you're doing is, is so, so essential and, and so important. Um, I, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about when you knew you wanted to be a documentary filmmaker and, mm -hmm. and what stories are you most interested in telling? I don't know when I'm like, when did I decide that? <laughs> I knew I wanted to be a filmmaker at 14 years old. Um, documentary in particular, I think first sparked for me when I was uh, at school at Northwestern and I took a documentary, an intro to documentary production class my sophomore year. Um, and that was like the first time that I was introduced to like critically acclaimed uh, documentary films. It's the first time I found out about Kartemquin, who's our co-production partner. And um, it kind of just clicked because I've always been the kind of person that is really interested in in how people work and kind of like how they got to be the people that they are today. So um, since I was already kind of building up my skill as a cinematographer through my schooling, um, it kind of just gave me an excuse to like <laughs> creep on people. That sounds like a weird thing, but it just gave me an excuse to like kind of dive into that that observational instinct that, that I was finding within myself. Um, and although I still, I work in a lot of different types of spaces, I'm not, I do, you know, branded content and narrative as well sometimes, but I find that I kind of align with documentary most naturally, I think because of that instincts, you know, the way I'm framing shots or positioning myself around the scenes that I'm filming, it's being informed by kind of the energy of the space and the people in the space and what I, how I think they would want to be presented or what I'm observing about their character that they may not see in themselves. Um, so even though this is like probably one of the hardest parts of the industry to like sustain yourself in, um, it really, I found that it's continually what is, what comes the most naturally to me and, and works really well with my eye as a cinematographer. Excellent. Did you ask another question? I feel like I missed it. Um, yes. And, and okay. what, what stories are you most interested in telling? Oh, yes. I'm honestly interested in the, in the stories that kind of um, I feel in my gut or like resonate the most with me. Uh, I didn't really like even with Unapologetic, I wasn't I was approaching it as a DP first. And then I ended up directing it because I felt like it was uh, an issue and a perspective that was so important to me that no one else could tell the story like I could. Um, and so as I've been looking to like the future work and the projects ahead, I'm really just trying to be in tune with that instinct uh, because I think that there's times for me to be in service of other people and then there's times for me to be in service of, of films myself. So uh, I really wanna make sure I have that passion and that energy when I'm going into a new project. Uh, and it's usually, I mean, it's usually around marginalized voices. Um, or people that I grew up in my around in my community or that I identify with, uh, because I really think a lot of marginalized uh, communities just haven't been able to see themselves, or they haven't been depicted uh, by the media in a in a compassionate and and caretaking way. And I think that they should be afforded that. You know, we should able to be able to see black people on screen in a visually appealing, caretaking way that isn't always extractive or feels like the media is flying in, getting the story and then leaving. So I'm really just interested in, in um, kind of affecting how people see themselves, but also like allowing them to recognize that, you know, black, I mean, I keep saying black people because I guess that's what it is. Uh, black people are, are extremely beautiful too and and deserve to be, um, to, to have their journeys documented and archived for the future. Uh, because that's been happening for white people for many, many years. So I, I think I'm just interested in uplifting those narratives and bringing them more to the center stage than they have been in the past. Yes. Thank you for 
all your work and the work that's coming to us in the future. Uh, would you mind yes. telling us about um, one of your what, what you have coming up next? Yes. So I'm developing two projects at the moment. Uh, one that is less that I can talk about, but it's about uh, an, an event that happened in Indianapolis, where I'm from originally in the 90s, um, and kind of how the political climate and the and the racial tension at the time um, influenced this event. I can't I'll say more when I sign the contract. And then um, I'm also working on a, a participatory family docuseries about my family patriarch from Mobile and Tuskegee, Tuskegee Alabama and his 17 children um, and how his influence uh, kind of brought them through this second wave of the great migration. So I got my plate full. I was trying to keep it empty, but... Um, <laughs> Like I said, the stories, you know, those were like I felt it and I was like, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna try this out and see what happens. Yes, that, that project sounds amazing and I can't wait to hear more. We have a question from our audience. Um, it's from Bean, and the question is there's so much beauty and camaraderie in activism. What was one of the most memorable moments for you while making the film? Mm. That's a great question. Oh, and there's so many. <laughs> Can I say two? <laughs> Please, yeah, we'd love okay. to. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one was definitely when I filmed uh, both Janae and Bella's birthdays. Um, that was the moment where I was like, there has to be moments of black joy in this in this film because I was so um, I was just so happy to see both of them kind of taking a break. And um, they, the parties just literally look like the same type of parties that I would have with my friends for my birthdays. So um, even though it's kind of bizarre, like being there with the camera and like everybody's like lit and like having a great time, um, I really, <laughs> I just saw, I was looking at she interpreted lit, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, so that, those were really wonderful moments to see them just like surrounded by community and love. And then I'll also say um, when I was able to travel down with uh, Bella and her mom to go visit her brother in prison, mm -hmm. um, that was actually the last scene in the film in, that we filmed for, for the film. And um, it really just gave me a lot of perspective about, about um, not only people that are incarcerated, but like the, the, the families and the communities and the systems that are impacted by their incarceration. You know, it was like a an eight hour round trip to go there and back. And, you know, they're spending multiple hours in there just trying to spend as much time as possible with him before they have to leave. Um, and so it just really showed me that, you know, there's so many people that are that have been pushed to the outskirts of society that have, you know, unfortunately been forgotten about in a lot of ways. Um, but they're not just isolated cases or individuals. They're still connected to systems and people and families that um, have to deal with it every single day. And for someone like Bella, you know, that's been her mom, her dad, and multiple other people in her family. So mm -hmm. it really just humbled me and um, allowed me to think about abolition uh, in like the prison industrial complex in a, in a different way. Uh, and really just, yeah, I mean, it was, it was the last thing we filmed with Bella because it, it took that long to, you know, get her to that trust level, but I'm just really grateful that both her and her mom opened us up to that journey uh, and, and you know, allowed us to see that side of their, of their family story. Now that, that, that's, I, that resonated with me too. And, and mm. the comment that, that Bella made um, that when a loved one is incarcerated, you're, you're essentially incarcerated with them too. You know, yeah. the emotional toll that, that it, it can take. Um, I, you know, I can't imagine. Yeah. So that was yeah. a, motivator um, for her and in, in starting the Sisters in Action Network mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. as well. So, um, well, that is all the time that we have. Um, I wanted to uh, take, once again, thank you, Ashley, uh, Director yeah, of, of Apologetic for, for joining us tonight. And congratulations again on, on being the recipient of the CIF 45 Streams Groundbreaker Award. Uh, so thank, thank you, you, our interpreter as well. Yes, and I'm you did great. <laughs>
<laughs> and now I'm going to hand things back over to our host for the second half of our show. Congratulations, Ashley, and thank you, Deidre. Also, thank you, Kelly Parker, for interpret interpreting the first half of our happy hour. Karen Schiller from the Cleveland Hearing and Speech Center will now be taking over for the rest of the evening. Thank you, Karen. Before we move on to the second half of tonight's happy hour, we would like to thank all of our special guests and our audience for raising a glass with us tonight. In my case, I'm still enjoying my can of Great Lakes Dortmunder Gold Lager. We wouldn't be here without your ongoing support to bring film home. And speaking of your support, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't ask you for the second time tonight to kindly consider contributing to our challenge match. By doing so, you will help ensure the future of the festival in our new home at Playhouse Square. Our goal is $145,000 in honor of our 45th anniversary. Please know that we are so grateful for any amount you are able to give when you visit clevelandfilm.org forward slash donate. And now let's head into tonight's second set segment led by Cleveland's one and only Dee Perry. <laughs> the festival is so fortunate to have Dee as a host of our official podcast, SIF Speaks, which is sponsored by Wayside Furniture. Here's Dee. Thank you, Marcy. And I am Dee Perry, a former broadcaster and current host of the festival's official podcast, SIF Speaks. And I'd like to introduce our special guests from the film Voodoo Macbeth. With us are Agazi Desta, co-director and co-writer of the film, Erica Sutherland, co-writer, Jewel Wilson Bridges, actor, Jason Phillips, producer, Jeremy Tardy, actor, and Bashir Ashkar, director of photography. Thank you all for being with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you for Thank having you. us. Yeah. Well, I, I want to start with you, um, Jason. You were the producer of the film, and it was written and directed by students from the University of Southern California School of Cinematic Arts, which you also attended. So I want to start by having you describe the program at USC that put you all together to make this film. Yeah. Well, first, thank you, Dee, for moderating this, and thank you for the Cleveland International Film Festival for giving our film a platform to reach audiences. It means so much to us. Um, in terms of Voodoo Macbeth, it kind of comes from a really weird mixture of a lot of students to come together in a weird like collaborating process to kind of make this feature film. So this is the seventh iteration of this feature film class at USC where eight writers write a write the film in the first semester in the fall. And then the producing um, faculty, John Watson, interviews producers, then hires three producers to come onto the project sometimes too. And then we go through all the different director reels um, from, the USC students, because the producers are usually alumni. Uh, and then we bring on the directors into the class. And so the students of this are actually just the writers and the directors. And then the producers work with the directors to interview past alumni from USC and some non-alumni to kind of fill up the crew and department heads to kind of bring this whole feature film to life. And then we work as a huge team to kind of bring the vision together and have 10 different segments of the movie that kind of come into one beautiful feature film that you see today. And I'm so lucky to have worked with the people all around me and for our amazing team. Uh, it was an incredible experience. Yeah. And, and quite interesting to watch too. And Agazi, um, I want to talk about um, you as a co-director, but first I want to jump into the, into the writing piece because the film is based on um, a real theater production from 1936, um, starring an all black cast and directed by a 20 year old Orson Welles. So were the USC writers totally in charge of choosing what to write about? And, and if that's the case, why did you choose that story, uh, the story behind Voodoo Macbeth? Right. Um, you know, first and foremost, just thanks for the opportunity, honor to be here. Uh, thank you, Amy, Mallory, Kelly, Kelsey, and Dee, all those that planned for the event. <laughs> Really, really honored to be here. Uh, so how it works, I think as Jason mentioned, um, John Watson, who's our executive producer of the film, uh, but also one of the professors uh, at the school had spearheaded the concept for his class. And he was looking for writers at the USC program to develop it. I, along with seven other writers, including my colleague, Erica, who's on the panel right now, 
applied to work in the writer's room while we were at school. Uh, during that year, we developed the concept over the course of three to four months, doing a ton of research prep beforehand on the actual story of Macbeth, um, the black climate of 1930s Harlem era, uh, and specifically, and the Federal Negro Theater Project. Um, but of course, the controversy behind Orson Welles directing all the black cast was, was paramount. Um, personally, I mean, I have strong interest in creating classic uh, novel to film adaptations. So naturally, I was interested in the class. I had a great history of cre creating films like that. Uh, but essentially, you know, essentially as a black filmmaker writing about a historic moment for black people and black theater uh, that people don't really know about uh, was, was crucial to me. Um, so I just hopped on the opportunity as soon as I could. And it's, it's a film, as I mentioned, set in 1936, but I'm also curious if you, as, as a collective of writers, chose this because it also speaks to 2021. Right, right. Um, you know, it was, it was, it's interesting. I feel like uh, even though this was was definitely, you know, kind of created um, for this this type of uh, audience, this this generation, I think that really we try to find parallels, um, you know, from 1930s Harlem uh, to now. So, I mean, I think like during the writer's pro process, it was really uh, interesting, you know, to just try to find um, unique ways to tell the story um, for this specific audience, um, you know, and, and trying to figure out a right rhythm to the script. Erica, um, as Agassi mentioned, there were more than half a dozen writers, including yourself, for the screenplay. I was trying to picture how you begin working together. I mean, take us through how you started the writing process and, and then how you organize eight, uh, eight, I think it is seven or eight individual yeah. viewpoints into a coherent script. Uh, that's a great question. So uh, I think just to piggyback a little bit off your previous question, we come into the class with an idea of the major components of the story, like the story that we're going to tell. We're no, we know that we're going to talk about this particular subject. So we came into the room knowing that we were going to tell a story about Orson Welles and his production of Voodoo Macbeth, which was the first black cast of, of for a classical play. So um, so we knew that coming in, we did not know what the story was going to look like, how we were going to achieve that. And so you get, and again, we have our, you know, our executive producer and professor um, spearheading this and he has a vision in his head of the story he sees, but at the same time, he wants to allow us to surprise him, throw some new things at the wall, see what sticks. So we come in understanding what we're gonna write, the six or eight of us, because the numbers actually, we're in school, so the numbers changed. Um, so uh, we get together, we just start, we start talking about the characters we see, we just start pitching things. And for me, the best thing about it was this whole introduction to like, the writer's room and the process that you take mm -hmm. in the writer's room and how you can be rewritten. And what started to happen is we, as writers started, after we got the structure on the board and we go back through and we just pitch ideas about structure and how the story is gonna move. And we may have what we want in act three down, but no idea how we're gonna get there <laughs> because we only have one and two. I mean, one and three and two is, you know, so it was, those are always interesting. And then after that, we would tell, we would just take a shot. We was like, hey, I think I wanna write this scene with uh, about Orson and his wife, or um, I gravitated more towards Rose and her scenes um, and some of the other characters, uh, but we would do that. And then we just go and write the scene, bring it back, sit, pitch it at the table. We read it out loud. We have comments about it. Somebody may go, oh, you know, I think I'd like to try that same scene and go and write that scene yeah, right, right. or rewrite you. And <laughs> you come back to the table and that's the best thing so to be did rewritten. You have to, did you actually have to fight for something that you believed in that you had written in? Oh, and, yeah, yeah, big time. Big, yes. Big time, big time. Wow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's tough. It, I mean, it was hard. But it wasn't think, bad, like, though, right? Yeah, it, it wasn't bad at all. No, no, no. no. We were, I think it was, it was definitely like a learning experience and collaboration. Yeah. Right? It was so interesting, honestly, D. Like, like, we really started to gravitate in our own direction to the parts of the film that were important to us. And so we stayed there. Like, 
it was so, not every room is like that. This particular room, we stayed with the characters that we love. We wrote them. Uh, we fought for them. Right. Um, and this, so it just panned out. It was a lovely experience. It's not like we had fights in the side of the writer's room and then we left and never talked to anybody again. No. <laughs> that would have been an interesting film in itself. <laughs> we'll talk some more about that. Um, I, I wanted to, to bring you, Jewel, into the conversation and, and start by saying that I was excited to see that you are a graduate of the musical theater program at Baldwin Wallace under Victoria Bussert. Um, it's one of my favorite programs um, to talk about um, in, in terms of broadcast stuff that I've done. But your role in Voodoo Macbeth as Orson Welles is a non-singing and very intense um, kind of thing. So you don't look like the pictures that I've seen of Orson Welles. And I was curious what you brought to the character um, that you felt was essentially him. Well, uh, first off, I'm so excited. This is kind of a, like a little mini uh, homecoming for me to okay. Cleveland. one. So even though I'm not there physically, I am there in spirit and I'm very proud of my alma mater and I, I, I do my best to make my alma mater proud. So uh, I love it, that first off. Um, also, I remember when I initially uh, submitted for the role, there was a hot second where that actor, that inner saboteur voice was like, hey, you don't look like, you don't look like Orson Welles because they had a picture that showed up and I looked at it. But I, in that moment, I was like, remember, it's not your job to decide what you are right for. You just put it out there and let the chips fall where they, where they may. And when I got cast, I knew that there was no way with the time, because I got cast and we went into production pretty quickly. And there wasn't gonna be enough time for me to put on any kind of weight or to kind of even create the physical illusion of looking like him. Mm -hmm. my, my vocal cords are much more of like a tenor, they're a little bit higher. So I knew in a way it freed me up because I was like, okay, I'm not gonna worry about the physicality of it. They cast me in this, so they believed that I brought something of truth to this role. I'm just gonna trust that. So to answer your question, I focused more on the spirit of it. I focused on what I knew about his psychology, his experiences, I focused on <laughs> what I knew truthfully in the story about uh, both in what they had written and both what I knew in in real history, how this cast really loved Orson. And I knew that the film that we were going to take him on a, in, in many ways, a much more intense ride than maybe, even though it was intense in historically, for theatrical purposes, for our story, it does get condensed and made a little bit more intense for the screen. Um, but all of that fed into me for me. I just focused on him being a creative and being intensely obsessive and passionate and something to prove, oftentimes at the detriment of collaboration around him. I mean, he's a 20 year old. When you think about a leader being in that position, what 20 year old today can you imagine directing a show of this nature? And he did that back then. That's insane. It takes a very rare character and a very rare personality to be able to inspire the kind of confidence and to pull that off. So those are all the things that I focus on when I brought him to life. And were there parts of the character? I mean, as you saw it unfold on, on the page in, in your screenplay, were there things, actions um, that, that happened for him throughout the, the film that you said, mm, I'm not sure how I feel about that. Well, I mean, the, the most obvious one, I don't want to give too much away, but the, the most obvious one was what happens at his kind of lowest point, because he does something in the movie that is incredibly uh, racially insensitive. And that's just putting it in a very, that, that doesn't even come close to what it is. And he almost loses the entire cast for it. So for me, reading right on the stage, uh, from the page, that was like the first thing that I just wanted to get on, on board with the writers and the directors, like, okay, how are we handling this? How are we going on this ride? Because for me playing Orson, I wanna make sure that we don't lose the audience because as soon as something like that happens, there's the potential that, and he does lose his cast. I also wanna make sure that he, in a way, he's not like, it's not just like, okay. Mm -hmm. And like all is forgiven because you also can't do that with this. When, it, when you so thoroughly hurt people, sometimes an apology is just like not enough. And I thought actually the way they approached it was really well done and it it happened, um, everything that happened in the film was as a result of a lot of care and 
and love and attention to what the whole purpose of the story is and for the greater community and for us eternally. So that, for me, since you have seen the film, that there's one part that was the most difficult. Um, but beyond that, honestly, it, it was such a wonderful experience from beginning to end. Even with all as many writers, directors, everyone was very conscious of working with actors and knowing that uh, the directors would only have like a small chunk of the film that they'd be working on and trusting us to know what our whole arc is and uh, taking our input uh, and as we went along, which was really, really lovely. So I, I, it, it was such an incredible experience collaboratively for me. Very cool. And uh, Jeremy, uh, Jewel mentioned a, a journey throughout the film and your character, uh, Maurice, um, definitely takes uh, a journey throughout th this film. When we meet him, um, he's operating the elevator in Orson Welles', Orson Welles apartment building. And as soon as Maurice hears about the all black production that Welles is putting on, he presses him about a role and Welles reluctantly says yes. So how do you personally relate to Maurice's journey from the beginning to the end of the film? Um, well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be with you all. Uh, and um, I'm really pleased that you all are, are screening our lovely little film. To your question, as far as Maurice is concerned, the the relatable point for me was the, the fact that he's a young actor who's trying to get an opportunity. And here's the guy who has the access for him, Orson Welles. Um, and at this point in Orson's career, while he wasn't the um, well-known director uh, that he would soon come to be, he was still a notable actor and he was doing radio plays and things like that at the time. So it would have been known to Maurice who he was and, and when the opportunity comes for him to potentially be involved in this production, he takes a chance and he essentially gives an elevator pitch to uh, <laughs> right. And I think that uh, what was so inspiring about that to me was just that many actors uh, oftentimes are seeking that, that one break or that one opportunity. And it just so happens that he runs the elevator in Orson's hotel. And so I think it's, it's, uh, it was an interesting point for me to get in. He has quite a journey. And I think that Maurice is one of the characters who he's a young guy he happens to be a young gay male who happens to be African-American in the 30s. Um, and to quote James Baldwin, uh, to be a, a gay black man, he would have essentially caught the lottery. If, mm. uh, if you go with the ironic uh, catch a phrase there because of what obstacles he'd have to face uh, in so many different uh, elements and aspects of his life. So that was very interesting and challenging in terms of trying to get into his head and trying to kind of get in his skin and figure out how he functions and operates from one space to another. But the space that I certainly could connect with was he's a he's an aspiring actor. And at one point, I was a very, very much so an aspiring actor. And that was an exciting point to try to to get myself in uh, where Maurice was concerned. And, and now you're an inspiring actor. Yeah. Oh, bless you. <laughs> um, I, I want to uh, just um, pivot for a moment and uh, encourage um, audience members to uh, add their own questions if you have them. And, and if not, we'll just keep on going this way. Um, I, I want to circle back to, um, to Jason and um, ask you if... Um, there were things that you knew about producing um, a full length feature film before you did this one, or if you were learning on the job. You know, that's an interesting question. It's a little bit of both. You know, this is the first full feature film that I had produced. I was um, so lucky to producing with Ivy and Miles, my two fellow producers, um, and to have that little community, and also Reef Olberg, who was our unit production manager and our co producer. And so my learning kind of came from being on set a lot in other positions, whether it being like a second AD or UPM or anywhere within the producing department. And this was kind of my first chance to take that leadership position in a full feature film. 
in college, I had some producing opportunities with short films and I've done that several times before. And so when I approached this movie, I was like, okay, I've done big hard movies before within shorts. Now I'm just gonna be doing that on a larger scale and for more days. Um, and so I've kind of taken like everything I learned down from being a PA, just throwing away garbage to, you know, my <laughs> bigger experiences where I was like making a sci-fi film, you know, I've done a lot of period pieces or, you know, um, future films. And I had kind of challenged myself all throughout my career at USC. So this was a great opportunity for me to kind of continue that journey within non-modern day films. Um, it's what I'm really passionate about. So I think what I brought to the table was just a, I just tried to be as confident as I can. I took the fake it till you make it <laughs> model to heart and was just like, all right, I can do this. Like 26 days shooting, I can do this. Like that's what I told myself every morning I woke up, I put in every ounce of my body into this project and into like lifting it off the ground with the team. Um, and so, you know, you do kind of learn on the fly. There are some days where I was like, wow, I would have totally done that differently. And other days I end and I'm like, I did it. Like, that one but, worked. Give me a, for, for instance, of, of a challenge that came up during filming that, that you had to deal with. Oh my gosh. There was so much. <laughs> um, when the power went out in the theater. Oh, oh yeah, we had a yeah, power probably. outage in the theater one day all in San Pedro. And that was one of the days where we just like had to that totally call it for the day. Cause we were just like, all right, the power is down. There's like no way for me to do it. I mean, this is like a small example of something that happened when we were on the Warner Brothers lot is I didn't think about what happens, how much trash accumulates with how many people we had. And so we had all these trash bags, like building up day after day. This is like a really gross logistic of the producing world, but we had all these trash bags, like growing and growing and growing. And then all of a sudden the last day of shooting, I was like, or of us being on the Warner Brothers lot, I was like, oh my gosh, I need to get rid of this trash. Like this isn't gonna disappear and I can't leave it. So then like I, me and the other producers like would pile trash into like truckloads and we would be going to different dumpsters, which I think you're not so stupid, and using dumpsters to like dump the trash. But it sounds like a Seinfeld like, episode. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to and this was like at four in the morning. Like this wasn't like, you know, just like a regular hour. Like I was so tired. Like there's pictures of me like chucking trash, like this huge dumpster. But like the lesson there was like, oh my gosh, those small details, trash is just as important as who's on screen. Like they're all details that need to be worked out and they can't just be left to the side. Like film has so many details. And so what that taught me was when I approach a day, I need to be thinking through the macro level details and the micro level details and how do those interact? Because ultimately what it did is it took me away from set because I had to deal with the trash when I could have just thought about the trash beforehand and it wouldn't have had that repercussion later. Um, so that's like a really weird example, but it really stuck with <laughs> me. Good yeah, it really it, carried with I mean, me. There's there's the the big universe of the film, but as a producer, you have to think of, about all the, the the tiny details that that work into going into what's on screen. And yeah. on that note, I, I wanted to jump back to Agazi and and talk about you as director. Um, everyone has has sort of touched on. Um, taking a chunk of the film and, and doing something with it. Did you have pieces um, that, that were specifically yours and you could say, yes, I, I owned that part of the film? Uh, yeah, yeah, it was interesting. I mean, um, we all worked in a shout out to my fellow directors for working together on this. Uh, they all know who they are. <laughs> you know, I mean, I wasn't on set every day, um, but you know, it was still, still a very unique experience, um, you know, many of the cast and crew obviously were there. Um, so we really, on the directing end, we just had to kind of like, you know, figure out, you know, ways to ensure that we all stay consistent. Um, it was a true lesson in collaboration for, for sure. And I, I think, you know, as a writer, there were certain scenes that I actually had directed, um, you know, on my own, like on, 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 the, on the physical set. So, yeah, I mean, it, it was definitely an interesting experience. Um, you know, very, very uh, unique in, in trying to adapt our own individual voices for a collective vision. Um, but yeah, yeah, it was really, really tough. And, and I'm thinking going forward, is is directing the track that you want to stay on or, or are you leaving yourself open to um, whichever way the career flows for you? 
No, I, I'm interested in uh, directing, uh, writing and directing uh, for sure, for sure. So how, as you look down the road, how can you see this experience um, helping you build a foundation for something in the future? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, really, uh, you know, again, filmmaking is all about collaboration. Um, so I feel like this experience uh, was entirely all that, just like, uh, you know, my fellow colleagues had said. But really, I think, uh, you know, writing writing is pretty, uh, it's a very internal process. And I think directing is a very external process. Um, and that that kind of came out uh, in this in this film. So, I mean, really the skill sets that we kind of developed, uh, you know, on, on sets uh, kind of like, you know, lends itself to a calling in that for me. Um, so, yeah, hopefully, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, it does. And and it also makes me wonder for you, Erica, was was writing, screenplay writing, the thing that you saw yourself um, moving towards um, for the future? Or do you have directing aspirations as well? So I am a writer director. Uh, yeah, so I took this class. I really wanted to, when I took this class, I was interested in focusing on the writing side of it. Um, at the first, at the beginning, I didn't understand how we were going to incorporate these directors. Like, honestly, I was like, I don't think that's one of the reasons why I didn't like go like to try to direct anything. I was like, I don't, I don't see it. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> looks like it's going to be a big cluster on the under other end of this one. But, um, but no, write a director. Um, I have a project in play right now as a director. So hopefully uh, we'll get to hear more about that project. Okay. Like in the next month, that'd be great. Oh, wow. I can great. announce that, that'd be cool. Um, but yes, so that's what we do. And you shout, And I wanted to also say, I think uh, Agazi said shout out to the directors, but shout out to the writers. Shout out like. to the writers. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I didn't even mention that. Yeah. But you already know, Erica. You already know. Shout out to the writers. You Absolutely. Because without know. us, this would not exist. <laughs> good time. Good time. Good time. Good time. Well so you're in the room good with time. me. So you know how it goes, right? Good time. Good time. Yeah. I mean, to piggyback that, shout out to the whole cast and crew that made yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. this was a huge labor of love um, on every department. Oh my gosh, D, like when we had our premiere, we at school, uh, I had no idea what we were gonna see. Cause we have, I've been a part of this process since literally the first thought all the way through the end. And one of the, and also worked on the rewriting team that worked as we were directing and producing the project, we were rewriting scenes so that they could go. Um, so it was myself and um, Morgan and we were, uh, had no idea, because sometimes you can get lost in the in the woods, in the trees, right? Uh, right? Had no idea what we were gonna see on that screen. And then what the actors brought to the team, what the departments brought to the team. I was sitting there, I was in, in, in amazement, like the casting director, um, Twinkie Bird, Tracy Twinkie Bird, she went and cast this, um, this beautiful piece, it's like, I was amazed. So I don't know how you guys feel, but I sat there and I was like, Oh wow, we really we did that. Yeah. We're good. Like we did that. <laughs> right, right. Oh, we did that. <laughs> and we're almost out of time, but I just want to uh, get Jewel and Jeremy's takes um, before we go on what you took away from this process. Because I'm I'm thinking you have not had an experience as actors um, like this in in terms of group writers, group directors, um, Jewel. I think, you know, there are certain projects that you, I think early on in your career too, you almost look back at, um, not only with pride, but like, oh, like boot camp. Like, I know that I'll never have like a film that will be like this. I, the closest I could ever imagine would be maybe more like TV, where you do have multiple directors over episodes, and then you have certain people that are concrete through the whole thing, the showrunners and producers and whatnot, who have consecutive eyes, like doing the whole arc. But I... I, I knew coming out of this that this would be a unique experience that I would never have uh, again. I was very grateful for it and I felt incredibly proud. And coming from like New York and being a theater guy out there, this was such a wonderful opportunity for me to meld my theater experience with, um, with media. And uh, it was one of the first times I got to, to really test my mettle and be able to see how I enjoyed collaborating with people on set versus on stage. 
And it was such a, I, I will never forget that production, if nothing else for that, because that's what I discovered, is that for me, the love and the joy and the thrill of like putting your whole heart and being on set until four in the morning and getting only a few hours of sleep and being so excited to come back to set mm -hmm. the next day. It's like, that is like the sign that you're exactly where you need to be. And that's how I felt for the entire ride. I was ready for a day off by the end of it. <laughs> but I, I was so, I was on cloud nine the whole time. Yeah. And it looks like um, we've lost Jeremy, but um, I just want to say um, I was so impressed with what he brought to the film and um, building that character from someone who has to appear subservient to someone who um, comes into his own and is ready to stand up for the integrity of, of who he is and, and what he's doing on that stage um, was, was so meaningful. The whole film process was really um, a joy to watch and congratulations to, to all of you for, um, for presenting it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for oh, oh, Jeremy. <laughs> I was just speaking for you, Jeremy. <laughs> all right. Lost connection or something. It's been a pleasure. Uh, and, and to briefly jump off your uh, question, I did hear the end of your question. Uh, the process was much, much more uh, simple than I thought it would be working with the, what was it, 10 to 12 different directors. Uh, I had had experience working uh, television, probably two directors in a day. Um, but having really the, the cohesiveness of the script, uh, which shout out again to the writers, because the script mm -hmm. was far more cohesive than you think it would have been for the amount of writers that were involved. Oh, really? to have that basis to then walk on set with, we obviously have the different interpretations with the directors, but being able to work from the script, work from the different prep that I'm sure respectively each of us actors did, at least for me, and I, I think it might be fair to say for everyone, it was probably uh, less complicated than than uh, I thought at least that it would be going into it. And that's they a good us, thing. They armed us really well. We All we ever had to do was just go back to the script if anything was in doubt, because everything yeah. that we needed was there. Um, and, and I have a late breaking question um, that I want to share before we um, wrap it up uh, from Aaron. <laughs> Were there any backstage films that you all look to for, for inspiration when um, filming and creating this one, films that, that do the same sort of thing that take you behind the scenes of a show getting up? Hmm. Hmm. That's a great question. Um, I, I mean, I would say like Birdman is the first thing that- Oh, I, mean, I love that, that film, yeah. Like that, yeah just Birdman that takes you behind a theater so intimately um, on both sides, so. I think that was great. I know Moulin Rouge was a big reference for our DP as well. Um, Agazi, I can let you speak to this a little bit yeah, more. Yeah, but. yeah, for sure. And I think that uh, because the film is, is is pretty unique in its structure, um, you know, there was a couple. There was a film called The Mad Whale that we also, mm -hmm. the writers, uh, you know, kind of gravitated towards as well. Say um, the name again. It's called The Mad Whale. That was also a USC uh, production um, that was created in that same class. And I think that was something that we all kind of, you know, had like a familiarity with, I think, in terms of in terms of writing. Um, but yeah, no, for sure, Birdman was actually one of the uh, the biggest uh, inspirations. And Erica, I'm not sure if there are you know things in the writing class that uh, or films in the writing class that we had brought up as well. But um, yeah, for sure. No, I think you you've about covered it. Um, and basically, and for me, for me, it was like going going to the history books. Um, mm -hmm researching the era, like looking at pictures. Uh, we did a lot of that source material. Our, um, our professor, uh, John Watson did a lot. I mean, before we started the class, we literally had a packet, the writers had a packet of just information that he had been compiling and sourcing mm -hmm. and gave it to us to read. A lot of research, <laughs> a lot of research. And then I, we kept it up. If something came up, we go research it. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah. And D, I just want to also say like congratulations to the production design team of this movie. They mm -hmm. really yeah. worked hard and researched amazing so much. Maren Jensen, yeah. um, just she, it was just incredible what she brought to the table in it's terms a of gorgeous looking movie. film. The yeah, walking yeah. on the set was just yeah. luscious. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't believe it was. It got so detailed. It was so and incredible. They, and they were like primarily a four-person team or five. So. 
it, yeah. it was really incredible. But that's for another day. <laughs> Yeah, and we're almost there. <laughs> but I, I want to thank you all so much for uh, once again being with us this evening for the happy hour, but also for just collaborating as beautifully as you did. And I hope uh, a lot of folks get to see Voodoo Macbeth. Thank Yay. you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the support, guys. Bye -bye. And I've been talking with Agazi Desta, Erica Sutherland, Jewel Wilson Bridges, Jason Phillips, and Jeremy Tardy about Voodoo Macbeth. And you can find out more about it at clevelandfilm.org. And all day we've been celebrating the um, birthday of the Cleveland International Film Festival. And uh, with our birthday bash sponsors, Pierre's Ice Cream, and we have drawn a winner for our uh, birthday bash giveaway. And Jean <laughs> R is the ice cream winner. Congratulations, Jean. Yay. 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 All right. I, I am going to uh, conduct my own happy hour with some Great Lakes brew over some Pierre's ice cream. And thank you all for being part of this. And uh, right. take care. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you to our interpreter, too. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>